Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. According to Max, something lurked in the woods that surrounded Lincoln Way. Something not human but not like any animal we'd ever seen or heard. He claimed that this creature had tormented the street's residents. Pets would go missing, only to be found some days later mutilated at the wood line. Backyard gardens would be torn up by paws too big to belong to rabbits or dogs. People would be kept awake at night by something scratching and banging on the side of their home, or snarls and howls that seemed to be right outside of their window. Supposedly, no one had seen the beast causing such trouble on Lincoln Way. At least no one who had stuck around to tell anyone about it. Max claimed that the street was abandoned out of fear, each occupied house being left after its inhabitants were spooked by an escalation in the creature's torment that would explain why most, if not all, of the houses still contained so many belongings. You don't take the time to load furniture into a U-Haul and empty your fridge if you're scared out of your mind. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Lochinvar is a private residence north of the town of Pontotec. The town is located about 20 miles west of Tupelo on Highway 6. Lochinvar Plantation is a true part of the Old South, steeped in the lore of the southern states and drenched in the traditions of long ago. Built in the late 1830s, the mansion was home to the Gordon family for many years and watched over by an old caretaker. The Gordon family is long gone now, but the old caretaker still watches over the place. Lochinvar was built by Robert Gordon, a Scottish adventurer in the late 1830s as a gift for his wife. At the time, Gordon owned a strip of land which stretched all of the way from Pontotac to Aberdeen, 60 miles away. Aberdeen was Gordon's own town. He had founded a trading post there in the early 1830s and named the place Dundee in honor of a town in Scotland. He later changed the name to Aberdeen. It was near Pontotoc where Gordon found the land where he wanted to build his home. The location that he chose had been the land of the Choctaw Indian chief Chinubi, and once the Indians were gone from the area, he began building the new house. After moving into the grand mansion, the Gordons would have one child a son named James. His earliest memories of Lochinvar included magnificent parties and his personal servant named Ebenezer. He could not remember a time when Ebenezer had not been a part of his life. He taught James to hunt and fish, told him stories, supervised his manners, and when he was old enough, packed his trunks and watched him leave for the University of Mississippi at Oxford 
in 1851. As the years passed, the beloved slave grew older and became known by the respectful name of Uncle Ebb. He remained particularly close to James Gordon, and their relationship went far beyond master and servant. In February of 1856, James married Virginia Wiley, and in December of that year, their daughter Annie was born. From the time that she could walk, Annie was attached to Uncle Eb. She followed him everywhere and begged him to push her on the swings and to tell her stories. Delighted, Uncle Eb took under his wing a new generation of Gordons. Then came the Civil War. Robert Gordon, now too old to be involved, gave the support and advice to James and they raised a company of Confederate cavalry, the first from northern Mississippi. Before James Gordon left for service, he called Uncle Ebb to see him. Take care of my family and the plantation, he told his mentor. My father needs your help and I need to know that you're here with my family. Don't let anything happen to them and I'll be back home soon. He embraced the older man and told him goodbye. This began Uncle Ebb's role as the caretaker and guardian of Lochinvar. Every afternoon he would begin his rounds of the property, making sure the gates were closed, the doors to the house were locked, and there were no strangers lurking around the plantation. He moved his bed to the hallway outside of Annie's door, where he slept from that night on. He took to roaming the grounds at various times throughout the night, carrying an oil lantern and making sure that everything was secure. As time passed, he learned other skills and began making repairs on the house and the farming equipment. He learned to cook and prepare the meals and even to darn socks and make repairs on clothing. Night after night, the light from Uncle Ebb's lantern circled the house, the barn, the garden, the pasture, and the orchards, reassuring himself that nothing was amiss and that the people he loved were safe. One night, while Uncle Ebb was on his rounds, a rider approached. It was Captain James Gordon, home for a brief stay at Lochinvar. A few days after he left, he was promoted to the rank of colonel, returning to combat with the 2nd Mississippi Cavalry Regiment, Armstrong's Brigade. Colonel Gordon and Uncle Ebb would never meet again. One rainy night, Uncle Ebb was roused from his sleep by a strange sound. He took his lantern outside and crossed the grounds in the storm. He was soaked to the skin before he was sure that everything was secure. A day or so later, what seemed to be a cold developed into pneumonia. In less than a week, old Uncle Ebb was dead. It was a long time before Colonel Gordon received word of his friend's death. He was in England at the time on a mission for President Davis. On his way home, he landed in North Carolina and was captured and imprisoned. He soon escaped and made his way to Canada. There, he met and befriended an actor named John Wilkes Booth. This casual friendship with Booth later pointed suspicion to Gordon when President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Luckily, Gordon was able to prove his innocence. After the war, Gordon finally learned that Uncle Ebb had passed away while carrying out his duties to the plantation. Many believe that since Uncle Ebb died before the war ended and before his guardianship of the Gordon home came to an end, he has not rested in peace in the years since the Civil War. As the years have passed, his oil lantern is still seen roaming the grounds of the Lochinvar estate. It has been seen for decades, and locals believe that the light belongs to the spirit of Uncle Ebb, watching over his beloved family throughout eternity. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, Please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show. 
listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. There was a mysterious force that, in Japan, is known as yokai. According to ancient Japanese beliefs, yokai, in Chinese kanji which means strangeness, mystery, or suspicion, are weird creatures that dwell in the borderlands and in spaces which are located in between. The belief in yokai was mentioned in Shokunai Hanji text dated to the 8th century and still this ancient belief is alive in the Japanese modern society. Yokai can take many different forms and are mostly associated with villages, old abandoned towns, deserted mountain passes. Yokai do not belong to anybody, they just exist, appear usually at twilight when our surroundings look strange and are difficult to recognize. They haunt bridges and tunnels entranceways and lurk and disturb at crossroads and thresholds. They are elsewhere, changing their forms and places. Research suggests that this creature dwells in the contact zone between fact and fiction, between belief and doubt. Yokai is the common name for monster, transformed humans and animals, demon, spirit, or goblin, People say they are simply monsters. Their nature varies from benign to mischievous to seriously scary. In his book, The Book of Yokai, Mysterious Creatures of Japanese Folklore, which is based on his long study of yokai, M. D. Foster mentions an intriguing and unpleasant story from a collection of tales from Yujai. This story tells of a monk traveling alone through the province of Setsu located in the vicinity of the present-day city of Osaka. Coming upon a deserted temple, he decided to settle in for the night and begins chanting an incantation to the guardian deity Fudo, who battles evil with his immovable faith and compassion. But suddenly, a crowd some hundred strong comes surging into the temple, every one of them with a torch in hand. When they got close, he saw that they were fantastically weird creatures, not men at all. They were all sorts of them, some with only one eye, some with horns, while their heads were more terrible than words can describe. The monk spends a terrifying night, surviving only because Fudo protects him. After the gang of Onai finally leaves and the sun rises, the monk is shocked to discover that there is actually no temple at all and he cannot even find the path that brought him there. Eventually, he meets some travelers who inform him that he is in the province of Hizen, hundreds of miles from Setsu. It is worth mentioning that Onai is a term usually associated with danger and fear. This term is generally translated today as demon or ogre. During the Haiyan period, Onai meant a nasty and threatening creature that frequently appeared in human-like form. Onai has an enormous evil power, and when engaged in fight, these terrible creatures can reattach body parts they lose in fights. They crush enemies with one blow from their spiked iron club. They can also fly, change form at will, and cause diseases, insanity, and death. Their favorite food is human flesh. Were these terrible Onai creatures responsible for teleportation of the monk to another very distant location? What did really happen to him? Uh. 
I was working for a produce company in San Francisco, delivering organic fruit and vegetables to the well-off residing in the Bay Area. Part of my route was in Mill Valley, which is located on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge. If you can imagine a bunch of rich hippie types living in the woods, you can get the gist in what this place looks like. Anyway, it was my first week on the job, so the driver that was leaving was riding shotgun while directing me throughout the day. We pulled up to this house, which had a ridiculously long driveway. So there I was, pumping this box of apples and whatnot to this monster house, and when I entered the front yard, the heebie-jeebies started to run up the back of my neck. I walked up to the front door with my head on a swivel and knocked on the door. No answer. I shrugged, put the box on the doormat, and turned around to a very old, very white old man in very white pajamas. He resembled Santa that was dipped in a vat of bleach. He just stood there with his dead stare. It was like he was looking through me without blinking nor moving and now that I think about it, I probably had the same expression. So, after five seconds or so, I just scurried around him while mumbling an awkward, um, uh, excuse me. I bolted for the truck, and when I jumped inside, my ride-along looked up from his book and asked how everything went. I just started up the truck, blurted out, I think I just seen a ghost, dude, and kicked up dust. Two weeks later, I had another delivery at that house but this time an older lady answered the door. I asked her if her husband was a heavier set man with a beard. She answered yes, but how did I know? So I told her about our encounter, and of course she replied back to me that that was impossible because he had died two years prior. Let me start by saying that I do not have an opinion as to whether or not spirits exist. I'm a Christian and we do not own a Ouija board. We do, however, have the odd ability to predict events and very accurate intuition in various members of our family. Last September, we moved into a new home. Initially, both children refused to take one of the bedrooms for an unknown reason. They just didn't want it. We gave it to our three, now four-year-old, thinking he'd put up less of a fight. We settled in, and shortly thereafter our son refused to sleep in his room. We would find him in various places of the house, desperately claiming there were monsters in his room. We initially thought this to just be a childish fear and brushed it off. The only odd thing I noticed was that both cats slept under the right window of his room. We put the letters Adam above his dresser, and the next day my oldest showed me that the A had fallen, and it now said, Damn. We laughed. Shortly thereafter, our four-year-old told us that the monster came in through his right window at night. He described the monster as the puppet man because there was something on his hand trying to tell him stories, but the man does not talk through his mouth. Our son described the man as large, with a hairy face. In my son's description, the man did not hurt or touch him, but continuously tried to tell stories or talk to him. When asked what the puppet man wanted, my son replied, to talk with me. My son also felt like this monster was invading his space. It had been months, and yet my son will still not sleep in the room. My son tells me the monster will not cross the doorway of his room because he can't. A little while later, he asked me if I had somehow come home from work, I work nights, put a ladder under his right window, climbed through the window and sat Indian style on the floor next to his bed. When he asked who it was, the visitor said, I'm a mommy. I informed him that it wasn't me and he stated, I didn't think she was actually you. This mommy wears a black dress and has dark hair. 
I think she is white-skinned. He does not fear her as much as the puppet man, and his fear of the room lessened some after her appearance. Within the last few weeks, my son has started to claim there was a 10-year-old boy named Michael around. When Michael's there, my son does come out of his room. We've heard my son talking to this Michael and playing with him. He pretends to interact with Michael. He appears to appreciate Michael's presence and even offers him toys. He describes Michael's skin as orange-brown and he has black hair. Within the last few days, he's been telling me that Michael has a woman, possibly mother, named Zozo. The woman is pinker-skinned with black and yellow hair. Clearly, she's associated with Michael. He's been using the name Zozo so frequently that I decided to Google it just to see if there was a cartoon character with that name or to find another logical reason for the name Zozo to keep coming up. I'm a little concerned and frightened that it suggested that this Zozo is a spirit entity. I'm not sure what to think of my son's strange monsters. However, if such a thing does exist, should I be concerned for his safety? Have you had a run-in with Zozo? I'm an idiot. I should have listened, but I'm stupid and stubborn. When someone tells you not to put your hand on the hot stove, you listen, right? And if you don't, you get hurt, and there's no one to blame but yourself. It started two weeks ago. My buddies and I had rented a cabin near a lake for the opening weekend of trout season. We fished, we drank beer, we cooked over the fire. We were having a great time. That Saturday night, as we sat around the fire with drinks in hand, we started telling ghost stories. Most of them were old urban legends, some of them were personal experiences, others were scary stories that ended with a hilarious insult to someone's mother. It was all in good fun. Until Max told us about Lincoln Way. Lincoln Way was a residential street in a town near where we lived in southwestern Pennsylvania. We were all familiar with it. My parents used to have a friend that lived in the last house on the Dead End Road, so I spent a good portion of my time there when I was a kid. The street was something of an oddity because every single house there was now abandoned. No one seemed to know why the residents of Lincoln Way just seemed to get out of Dodge leaving behind food, furniture, and even cars. A local group of urban explorers had recently posted an article on their Facebook page about it, finding that the houses still had the same owners as they had as far back as the 70s, but no one was willing to live on the now overgrown street. Most people assumed that the people moved away from Lincoln Way because of the poor economy taking its toll on an already poverty-stricken area but Max claimed to know better. He claimed to know the real reason that the residential street no longer had any residents. According to Max, something lurked in the woods that surrounded Lincoln Way. Something not human, but not like any animal we had ever seen or heard of. He claimed that this creature had tormented the street's residents. Pets would go missing, only to be found some days later mutilated at the wood line. Backyard gardens would be torn up by paws too big to belong to rabbits or dogs. People would be kept awake at night by something scratching and banging on the side of their home, or snarls and howls that seemed to be right outside of their window. Supposedly, no one had seen the beast causing such trouble on Lincoln Way, at least no one who had stuck around to tell anyone about it. Max claimed that the street was abandoned out of fear, 
each occupied house being left after its inhabitants were spooked by an escalation in the creature's torment. That would explain why most, if not all, of the houses still contained so many belongings. You don't take the time to load furniture into a U-Haul and empty your fridge if you're scared out of your mind. I was skeptical of the story, as any reasonable person would be. Lincoln Way might not have been surrounded by other residential streets, but it was right off a main road. That main road had a gas station and a bar less than a minute down the road one way and an entire town less than two minutes in the other direction. Surely, if there was some terrible creature in the area, it wouldn't stick to that one road and the patch of woods that surrounded it. My parents' friend had moved out of that neighborhood almost 20 years ago, so my argument that he had never had a problem with Bigfoot was almost immediately swept aside. When I suggested that we go check it out next weekend, I was met with horrified stares and exclamations of disapproval. You can't go there. I just told you that something horrible lives there. There's no way in hell I'm going there. I'm too pretty to die. And dude, even if there isn't some weird monster there, I'm not risking getting arrested or hurt by wandering around a street full of houses that are probably falling down. And there are probably a lot of rats. I hate rats. Were just some of the arguments I heard. Only one person out of the five other guys that sat around the fire with me that night was willing to explore with me. His name was Sam, and he was a big guy covered in tattoos. Sam was arguably the biggest badass in our group, but behind the beard and drawings of skulls and other crazy stuff that was inked into his skin, he was a great guy and a loyal friend. The only reason he agreed to go with me was because he didn't want me to go by myself. He saw that I was determined to debunk Max's story and told me I'm not letting your dumb ass go in there alone and get mugged by some hobo squatter or some weird crap. Your mom would be pissed at me, and she's way scarier than Bigfoot. So the next weekend, last Saturday to be exact, Sam picked me up when we got off work and we drove to Lincoln Way. Sam parked his blue pickup truck in front of one of the houses at the beginning of the street. It was still light outside, but it was later in the day, so we brought flashlights with us. We didn't know how long we would be there or how dark it would be inside the dilapidated houses that we were determined to explore. We decided to walk along the wood line first, which meant walking through the overgrown backyards of the houses. We tried to look for evidence of digging in the yards, but the grass and weeds were so high that it would have taken forever to scan the ground it grew from. We walked the length of the street through the backyards, crossed the street at the dead end, and walked down the opposite side through those yards. When we were confident that nothing was going to jump from the trees and grab us, we started looking inside the houses. Sam and I weren't comfortable going into many of the houses because of how run down they were. The ones we didn't enter, we looked at the insides through first floor windows. Every house on the block was full of belongings, and most of them looked like they had been ransacked. Furniture was overturned, thrown against walls, photos were strewn all over the floors, the curtains that still hung were shredded, and pillows, throw pillows and those for beds, were torn open. Out of all of the houses, there were only four or five that weren't tossed, and those houses were more disturbing. The houses that we entered that didn't look like a hurricane hit the inside looked like someone could have been living there, minus the dirt and grime. Pictures still hung on the walls, books were still on the shelves, beds were made, and dishes were in the sink. One of the houses had food on the table, though it looked like some small critters had munched on it long ago. It looked like the previous residents literally just up and left in the middle of dinner without bothering to take anything with them. One of the houses had a garage, its door looked like it fell off the track long ago. It still had a car parked inside. The sun was almost completely set when Sam and I exited the last house we had explored, and we were thoroughly creeped out by our findings. 
so we decided it was time to call it a night and go home. We were walking towards Sam's truck when we heard it. Scratch. 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 Bang! We froze, standing completely still in the middle of a cracked road, and listened to the sounds for a minute or so. It was coming from behind the house to our left. Sam whispered that we should get the hell out of there, but I wanted to prove Max wrong. Like I said at the beginning, I'm an idiot. I slowly made my way toward the noise, keeping my hand cupped over the front of my flashlight. I was about to round the corner into the backyard when it stopped. I listened for a few seconds, standing completely still. I could hear something coming toward me slowly, something big creeping through the tall grass. I pressed myself against the side of the house and looked back to see Sam still standing in the middle of the road. A deep, guttural snarl made me turn my attention back to the yard. And I saw it. It stood on all fours and was as big as a horse. Thick, black hair covered its massive body. Its muscular front legs were tipped with claws longer than my fingers, and its mouth was full of too many razor-sharp teeth. The few people I have described it to reasoned that it was a bear or a large wildcat far from home, but it didn't look like either of those. The beast's head almost resembled a massive dog except for the horns perched on either side. I stared into deep, red eyes, rooted to my spot with terror as this creature slowly made its way closer to me. Another growl escaped from its throat and I began to shake so badly that I dropped my flashlight. The sudden movement and flash of light seemed to startle it. I took my chance and ran back to the street, screaming for Sam to get into the truck and start the engine. I could hear heavy paws hitting the ground not far behind me as I ran faster than I have ever run in my life. I launched myself into Sam's truck and he threw it into gear and pulled a U-turn to get us the hell out of there. The truck's headlights illuminated the beast for a moment as it stopped in the middle of the road to avoid being hit. What I had thought was fur was actually closer to a mass of thin porcupine needles, and every one on its back stood straight up as the beast crouched to spring at the truck. Sam was speeding toward the main road when we heard the howl of the creature. It sounded pained and angry, as if it was starving and upset that it was denied a meal. We now know why Lincoln Way was abandoned. The people were harassed, maybe worse, by some kind of monster that resides in the woods, waiting for someone to investigate a strange noise so that it can attack. It's hungry and vicious, and it's not alone. I know this because when Sam was turning the truck around during our great escape, his headlights briefly pointed into the woods. That's where I saw at least three more sets of deep, shining red eyes. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. This story took place during my childhood in the 1970s. We lived in Manchester, UK in a council property in a now derelict part of the city. Back then, the houses were considered old, quite run down. That house always had a strange feeling for me, particularly the cupboard under the stairs. 
I never felt comfortable leaving the living room unless I was with one of my parents. I always got a feeling of real dread any time I approached that point of the hall and used to run full out of the living room to the stairs and run all the way up them, then rush down them. I never, ever saw anything, but the feeling was sheer terror and horror. One night, my dad had taken me up to my bed and tucked me in, leaving the door slightly open to allow a little bit of light to come in from the upstairs hall landing. I fell asleep quickly that night. Sometime later, I was woken by a hand on my right shoulder. As I opened my eyes and turned around expecting to see one of my parents, I was shocked to find an old woman whom I'd never seen before leaning over the bars of my cot bed looking down on me. I let out a scream and started shouting for my dad. As I did this, the old woman, whose face was heavily wrinkled, with her hair pulled tight into a scruffy bun, wearing a typical granny-type apron and her dress with the sleeves rolled up to the elbow, began backing off, bringing her hand to her mouth and ushering me to shh, before saying, it's okay, shh. She continued to back off into the far corner of the room, all the time urging me with the shush. She eventually vanished into the darkest corner of the room moments before my dad came running into my room. I had him search the room from top to bottom, but no one was there, no sign of anyone. He checked the window, it was locked. He checked my wardrobe. It was empty, other than my clothes, and it was too small for anyone to hide in, including me. A few years after we left that house, one of my aunts told us she'd been talking to a local resident when she'd asked specifically about the house we'd lived in. The woman then told her about a couple who had lived there sometime in the late 40s through until the mid-70s. It seems they couldn't have children, though she desperately wanted to. Over the years, she became more bitter and resentful to her husband to the point where she would lock him in the cupboard under the stairs for days on end. He died sometime around the late 60s. She lived until a year before we took on the property, apparently dying in the house and being found in the front box room, which later became my bedroom. Cornelius Piros is a young man from Malaysia that I met in Nagoya through mutual friends. He had been a practicing medical doctor in Malaysia before he took a sabbatical to come to Japan and learn the Japanese language. After meeting him at a series of parties and social events, he came to be a good friend with my wife and I, coming to our home in Nagoya many times for dinner parties, barbecues, and so on. Cornelius's encounter with Japanese ghosts occurred in Malaysia when he was a student. I was a student at the Anglo-Chinese school in Ipoh, Malaysia. It was a high school with a long history built in 1893. At the time, I was living in the school dorm in the student hostel called Horley Hall. There were many strange things going on at Horley Hall. While staying there, I twice met something that was not usual. Three days after starting at the school, I was walking outside near the hall and saw a teacher there, an Indian woman dressed in a white sari. She was standing there with a sad look on her face. This was my first time to see this teacher. So later, I asked one of the older students who is the teacher who wears a white sari. He looked at me strangely and then asked, does that teacher have short hair? There's only one teacher working here who wears a sari, and she always wears a red one. She doesn't wear a white sari. After thinking a minute, he took me to the school library. On the wall were pictures of past teachers at the school. He showed me a picture of the wife of a former headmaster. Her name was Mrs. Threethram. He asked me, is this the woman you saw? Yes, I answered. She committed suicide by burning herself in a fire in front of the school. She killed herself because she thought her husband was having an affair with another woman. 
Since then, many others have seen her ghost walking around the school. After that, I was sick with a high fever for a whole week. Also, sometimes the students would see Japanese soldiers who had died in World War II walking around the school. One early morning, around 2 or 3 a.m., all the students in my hostel, about 20 people in all, woke up because they heard a large group of people marching outside the hostel. There were often many school groups marching around during the day, but we wondered who was marching in the middle of the night. We went outside and looked across the field and we saw no one there, but we could hear the loud marching for 20 or 30 minutes. We heard men issuing commands in Japanese. We were more than a little disturbed by this, so we called up the school warden. He said, don't worry, the last group of students who stayed in your hostel heard the same thing and they were okay, so nothing will happen to you, just go back to bed. We later learned that the British Army had occupied the school during World War II. When the Japanese came, there was fighting and many British and local people were killed there. The Japanese soldiers used the school as a base and they tortured and killed many people there. The basement and the underground toilets were used as dungeons. I heard that there were blood-stained tiles in the underground rooms from the tortures that had happened when the Japanese were staying at the school. The school replaced the tiles many times, but every time the bloodstains would reappear. Finally, the underground area was sealed off. There were rumors that there was an escape tunnel down there that led to the river. Later in the war, when the British and American soldiers returned, many Japanese were killed in the fighting on the school grounds, and the students still see and hear the ghosts of the Japanese soldiers that were killed there. When I went to college, my parents carefully chose an apartment for me. They were worried I'd spend more time partying than studying. The apartment my parents rented for me was old, and I shared it with three other students. It was actually very nice, and I was excited to move in. I had no idea that I would come face to face with the paranormal. Once I moved in, some strange things started happening. It started with the TV in the living room. We were sitting on the couch watching TV. The remote was sitting under the table that the TV was on, upside down. The back was off the remote, so we could see that there were no batteries in it. The sound on the TV was low, so I asked one of my roommates to turn it up. He refused, so we just sat there. However, the volume bar on the TV started to go up and remarkably stopped at a comfortable volume. For some time, we were all a little creeped out by that. After some discussion, we had decided that if our apartment was haunted, it was probably not haunted by some kind of evil spirit. After that, I started hearing strange noises at night. Not creaks or bangs, just ticking noises. A few nights later, I was in my bedroom trying to get to sleep when I heard a loud crash on the wall behind my head. The mirrored door on my closet actually shook. Right after it shook, my bedroom doorknob began turning rapidly. That stopped and my bathroom doorknob turned rapidly. After that, my VCR, which was to the right of my bathroom, turned on and then off by itself. The window to the right of the VCR then began to shake. Then the thud behind me again. I had no idea what was going on and I had absolutely no explanation as to what was making the noises. Nobody else had any experiences in their bedrooms, and I didn't have any more after that. But the TV in the living room was still affected. I've long moved out since then, but I still think it was an interesting story. Also, I was interested in theories on what or who was in our apartment. I was dog-sitting for a friend in Queens one evening. I had the TV on, popcorn in hand, and the dog, 
a muscly but very sweet pit bull snoozing next to me. The front door was in view in this very small apartment on the third floor, and all doors and windows were locked. Suddenly, the pup perked up and deeply growled. She jumped up and ran around the corner into the kitchen. I followed her, standing in the middle of the kitchen, is a shadow person. I could barely see the counter behind it, and it looked vaguely wispy around the edges. Roughly six feet tall, just standing there, looking at the dog. The dog stops, hackles raised, growling at the thing and barking. I gasp. The thing turns to look at me and takes a step back, almost in shock. Maybe it was shocked that I could see it? I quickly yell at it to leave, tell it that it is not welcome here, and that it can never come back. It walks through a wall. The dog and I eventually calmed down. I was 15 and I was at a birthday sleepover and we were all in the living room. At around 11 p.m., everybody went to sleep but me. I was lying on the couch watching TV and eating. It was 2 a.m. and everybody is still sleeping. There is a half wall that separates the living room from the other rooms and all of a sudden I can hear somebody walking from the other side of the wall. I thought it was my mom or dad, but I remembered that they weren't home. I was getting very nervous. I kept my eyes on the TV, but I could still see out of the corner of my eye and all of a sudden I see a head peeking from behind the wall and staring at me. I was freaking out on the inside, but looked calm on the outside. Then the whole body was standing there looking at me. I made out the form and it was an old man. All of a sudden, he started walking towards me. I threw the blanket over my face, saying out loud, not real, and kept repeating it over and over. I could feel this ghost leaning over me, and the next thing I know, it's trying to pull the blanket away from me. While this was happening, I took my leg from underneath the blanket and started kicking one of the girls and shouting for them to wake up. When the girl finally woke up, the pulling stopped. I said sorry to the girl for kicking her, lied to her, saying that sometimes I kick in my sleep when I don't. Around 9 a.m., everybody left but me. I stayed behind to help clean up and I told my friend and her parents what happened. They started laughing, which was making me mad. They told me it was my mom's father and that he died in the back bedroom and that he liked to play practical jokes and sometimes scare people when he was alive. And when he died, the family started experiencing the weird stuff that happens with ghosts and the paranormal. They told me what had happened to me was the ghost's way to welcome me to the family. I never stepped inside her house again. No matter the time of day or season, Sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee, fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked.
The Orang Bunyan are mysterious, invisible whistle people living in the forests. In Malay folklore, the whistle people are believed to be forest spirits that are responsible for a number of mysterious disappearances in the forests. Forests have played an important role in legends, myths, and fairy tales from all over the world from the dawn of recorded history. The forest was believed to be the seat of ghosts, gods, and monsters, or the underworld. It was long believed that forests were places full of magic. They were inhabited by diverse mythical beings, all endowed with superhuman powers and characters often appearing in human form. Some of them possessed benevolent qualities, seeking to do good to mankind, but according to ancient Slavic beliefs, the forests were full of mythical beings of an unusually malevolent type, always trying to work harm. In many beliefs, the forest was a great danger and a gloomy, mysterious, inhospitable area of magic, evil spirits, and darkness that should be avoided. The Orang Bunyan in Malay folklore are cunning beings that deliberately whisk people away to another world that the searchers cannot see. Their name comes from the word bunyai, meaning sound, and refers to the fact that while you may hear them, you will never see them. The Orang Bunyan are sometimes also called the hidden people. These supernatural beings inhabit the deep forests or high mountains far from human contact. It is believed that they also live near human communities and are even said to share the same houses as human families. Their social structure is similar to that of humans in the ancient Malay Peninsula, with families, clans, and even royalty. The Malays, an ethnic group of Austronesian peoples predominantly inhabiting the Malay Peninsula, eastern Sumatra and coastal Borneo, as well as the smaller islands which lie between these locations, have ancient legends of the Whistle People, telling that if you hear shouting, singing, laughing, or babbling in the woods when you approach the source of the noise, you will not even see their shadows. Malays, as other Southeast Asians, have always taken great interest in stories of ghosts and spirits. It must be stressed that, due to the animistic root of Malay folklore, these ghosts are seen as sharing the plane of existence with humans and are not always considered evil. As with other mythical beings in Malay folklore, the whistle people must be appeased with certain rituals and customs before humans are allowed to trespass areas which they inhabit. Even though they are responsible for a number of vanishings, they are considered benevolent beings. They've been known to befriend and assist humans, particularly magicians and shamans. It is even possible for them to intermarry with humans and bear invisible children. It is believed that the Orang Bunyan can use magic to become invisible to anyone except those who have spiritual sight. The following article comes from the New York Sun, September 20, 1907. Haunted by Wife's Ghost – Appeal of Man Who Wants to Take Her Body from Potter's Field New York Explaining that for two years he had been haunted by his wife's ghost, John Crane, a laborer of 261 East 71st Street, yesterday appealed to Coroner Harbinger to assist him. His wife committed suicide in 1905 by jumping into the East River. When the body was recovered, Crane was sent for, but he denied knowing the woman. He told Coroner Harbinger that he had refused to make the identification, owing to the gossip of his neighbors who had said he was really glad to get rid of his wife because he wanted to marry a younger woman. That's why I let Bridget go to the potter's field, God forgive me, he said, but I've had no peace of mind ever since, nor sleep. Night after night, she comes to me and rebukes me for letting her lie there with the unknown dead. She was a decent woman and I did wrong. Please let me dig her up and put her to rest in consecrated ground. Coroner Harbinger said that all he could do was to accept Crane's identification as the official one 
and he would gladly do that if it gave him any comfort. But it was up to the health department, he said, to give permission to disinter a body. The blessing of God on you all, said Crane, as he left for the health department. This happened 10 years ago, and I was working as a nurse in a hospital for old, helpless people. Most of them were constantly lying in bed, slowly dying in a sort of coma. I was on the night shift with a very dear female member of my team. We loved to work together. Imagine that we were the only two healthy persons in a house filled with 120 patients. Of course, half of them were able to look after themselves and completely independent. On our main checkup and take care tour that took place from 3 a.m. to 5.30 a.m., we had two wards left, changing pampers, give medication, made people drink, etc., so we entered the second ward, and I heard a strange kind of noise, very loud and clear with some disturbances, like a radio, but I couldn't understand what the person was saying. It was a female voice. I told my friend to listen, and she said, Strange, seems like someone has put on TV or the radio. I answered, Stephanie, how is a paralyzed person going to put on a radio or TV? Anyway, this seems like a person talking next to us, not from inside a room where the door is closed. She looked at me. You're right, but let's continue. We were listening, but the voice suddenly stopped, and so I thought maybe I'm just tired. We went to our next patient and had to change the entire sheets, wash the man and put fresh pajamas on him because he and the whole bed were full of liquid excrement. So this took us a lot of time and we were running from the bed to the bathroom and so on. Finally, Stephanie told me that she would put a new shirt on the man so I started to carry all the dirty stuff outside in the hall, where our caddy was placed. Because of our need in sheets, blankets, skin products, towels, etc., the door of the room was open to have free access to the caddy. So I turned my back to my friend and I heard her talking with the man, moving him. A sheet fell down on the floor while I was talking, so I had to go down to grab it from the floor. And the moment I took the blanket, I looked through the open door into the hall, and I swear a little old person in a white nightgown passed through the hall. It didn't touch the floor. It was like floating, completely silent. First, I thought, what the... Stephanie was just now at Mr. X's bed. What is she doing in the hall? Remember that as nurses, we were dressed in white. The logical question that if Stephanie would have left Mr. X, I would have seen her leaving the room. That didn't come to mind. I simply stood there, frozen. All of this happened in seconds. I heard Stephanie's voice behind me. Hey, what's going on? You want to carry those dirty sheets all night? She laughed. I jumped and said, Steph, but you were just outside in the hall. No, I was dressing and installing Mr. X, remember? What's wrong? Your face is as pale as snow. You feel unwell? You need to throw up? I put everything I had in my arms on the floor and ran into the hall. I still saw the apparition of the woman before she vanished through the wall. Steph came after me as I was standing there with goosebumps all over my body and trembling from terror and cold. We were in the midst of the summer, but I swear to you in the hall it was as cold as a refrigerator. Steph said, wow, why is it suddenly so cold? She hadn't seen the woman, and I told her, don't ask me why. I said, we have to go downstairs. Mrs. Z has just died. Incredibly, she looked at me. What? How would you know? We just looked after her. She was sleeping. Steph, I swear, she is dead. I've seen her ghost passing through the hall. Confused, my friend followed me downstairs, and when we entered Mrs. Z's room, it was a peaceful and warm atmosphere inside. In fact, she died a few moments before. Her body was still warm, so we called the med. At the end of the shift, we washed and dressed her in a beautiful gown. I was silent all the time, but Steph couldn't believe it. She was talking, asking me questions. At home, after work, I fell in my bed. I was not afraid anymore or scared 
simply surprised. I slept a few hours and dreamed of Mrs. Z. She came towards me, much younger than I've ever seen her, healthy and surrounded by a sort of white light. She told me, thank you, dear, for looking after me all these years. I'm leaving now. Much later, when I occupied my mind with events like this, I realized that the radio we had heard at the beginning was an EVP of Mrs. Z. During the heyday of spiritualism, many of the mediums that practiced at the time made use of what were called spirit cabinets, enclosures where the medium could be segregated from the guests while they were in a trance state. Many of the cabinets were actual wood enclosures, although it was more common for a corner of the room to be hung with a curtain and closed off from view. The cabinets became the medium's workspace, and their purpose was to attract and conserve spiritual forces. Paranormal researcher Herward Carrington referred to a spirit cabinet as a spiritual storage battery. Although the spirit cabinet later became standard equipment for mediums, it was first introduced into the American spiritualist movement by the Davenport brothers in the middle 1850s. None of the earlier mediums in the movement, including spiritualism's founders, the Fox sisters, ever used such a device. The idea behind the cabinet was to be able to section off the medium from the sitters so that they would be out of direct view when producing strange phenomena. This would prove to be both popular and astounding to audiences, as the mediums were generally bound hand and foot in the cabinet while seemingly impossible phenomena manifested around them. For fraudulent mediums, the spirit cabinet was a great gift. With only a limited amount of skill as an escape artist, the mediums could amaze their sitters while hidden away from view behind curtains and wooden doors. Ropes could be easily shed and then an assortment of spirit phenomena could be produced. In most cases, the sitters would be invited to inspect the cabinet ahead of time so that they would be satisfied that no secret entrances or trap doors were present. The medium would then enter the cabinet and be seated in a chair, where they would often be tied up to prevent fraud. After slipping their bonds, the phenomena would begin. There were several ways for the mediums to collect their materials for the hoax. Often, spirit forms would appear. They would usually be made up of soft cloth or chiffon, which is very compressible. It could easily be secreted in the medium's clothing and then unwrapped or draped over the medium for a full materialization would appear ghostly in the dim light. The cloth could also double for ectoplasm as well, a spirit substance that allegedly exuded from the medium's body. If the medium allowed himself or herself to be searched prior to the seance, the materials could also be smuggled in by the cabinet attendant who acts as the medium's bodyguard. Spiritualists say that this person is present to protect malicious intruders from touching the medium's ectoplasm which could cause injury or death, but in reality they were merely accomplices in the fraud. The medium would be dressed completely in black, and when they emerged from the cabinet with the ghostly cloth, it would appear to be moving on its own. The ball of material would be slowly unwound, and in the near total darkness the effect would be eerily convincing. The medium could also drape his body in the material and then, while standing in front of the cabinet and moving the black curtains back and forth, he could create the illusion that the spirit form was moving sideways and up and down. Combined with the spooky music and chilling dramatics, it's no wonder that so many were convinced of the reality of the spirit cabinet seances. Not surprisingly, the claims being made by the spiritualists about their contact with the dead inspired a need for the investigation of those claims. This research was not done so that the spiritualists could be exposed as frauds, although this sometimes happened, but because the evidence that was being presented had to be questioned. This new method of psychic investigation began shortly after the birth of spiritualism. By the 1850s, 
science had managed to challenge the hold that religion maintained on society, offering a new version of the truth for people to examine. Mixed in to this time period was spiritualism, with its alleged proof of life after death, and the public became fascinated by it. Not long after, however, many of the practitioners of this new faith were exposed as frauds and a division formed between those who believed in spiritualism and those who did not. The scientific establishment, resentful over the fact that they had managed to break the hold that religion had on society only to lose their footing to spiritualism, encouraged the debunking of mediums and had a blatant disregard for anything that even hinted at the supernatural. In spite of this, there were a small number of scientists who had taken the time to attend seances and who believed that there could be something to the strange phenomena that were being reported. They decided to try and apply the laws of science in investigating these reports. By the late 1800s, there were a number of scientists who investigated the claims of mediums. Many of them operated independently, while others formed groups, like the Society for Psychical Research, or SPR, which became one of the most esteemed investigative organizations in the world. One of the most eminent men to become involved in psychical investigation was Sir William Crookes, one of the great scientists of the modern age. Crookes' decision to delve into spiritualism was greeted with wide approval. The popular press felt sure that Crookes would soon show that spiritualists' claims were nothing more than ridiculous humbug. Crookes appeared to share that view. When he announced that he was going to begin his investigations, he stated that he had no preconceived notions on the subject and then added, the increased employment of scientific methods will produce a race of observers who will drive the worthless residue of spiritualism hence into the unknown limbo of magic and necromancy. This grandiose statement was taken as a disclaimer of belief in spiritualism, but if Crook's private beliefs had been better known, it could have been interpreted that he intended only to disprove the worthless residue of psychic frauds without prejudice to spiritualism's basic beliefs. Crooks had first come into contact with spiritualism in 1867, and his diary entries for December 1870, within months of declaring his intention of studying spiritualism, showed that he was already a firm believer in the possibility of the unknown power. Crooks was born in London, 1832, and was largely self-taught, with no regular schooling, until he enrolled in the Royal College of Chemistry at age 16. He graduated in 1854 and took a position as the superintendent of the meteorological department at Radcliffe Observatory, Oxford. A year later, he took a teaching position as a professor of chemistry at Chester Training College, but resigned after one year because he was not given a laboratory in which he could do research. Although he tried to find another teaching position, he was never successful and most of his later work was done in a laboratory at his home. In 1856, Crooks married Ellen Humphrey, with whom he had eight children who survived infancy. From his home, he began writing and editing for scientific journals like the Chemical News. He also helped to found the Quarterly Journal of Science in 1864. In 1861, Crooks achieved the first of his scientific discoveries, the element thallium and the correct measurement of its atomic weight. This got him elected a Fellow of the Royal Society at age 31. Then, in 1867, a turning point came in Crook's life with the death of his youngest brother Philip. The two men had been very close, and Crooks was disturbed by his brother's death. Like others of the time who suffered a bereavement, he turned to spiritualism for answers. At the urging of his friend and fellow scientist Cromwell Varney, Crooks and his wife attended some seances to try and make contact with Philip. Although the details of these sessions are unknown, Crooks believed they were successful. One of his first seances was with the famous medium D.D. D. Holm, where Crooks was amazed to see phenomena that he never dreamed possible before. The scientist was not content to simply observe Holm's manifestations, he also attempted to recreate them in the laboratory, and this was also successful. Crooks applied strict scientific control during his research with Holm, and the meticulous testing failed to find any evidence of fraud. He believed that Holm possessed 
a psychic force which emanated from his body, and he wrote a paper on the subject, believing it to be of scientific importance. Not surprisingly, the paper was first rejected, and then met with scorn and derision when it was finally published. His critics, mainly other scientists, scoffed and stated that the phenomena Crookes reported could not have occurred, that it was simply impossible. I never said it was possible, Crookes famously replied, I only said it was true. Although the scientific community frequently criticized him, Crookes doggedly continued his investigations into the spirit world, testing mediums and publishing material on the science of the afterlife. Crookes' last series of sittings were experiments conducted with a medium of rather dubious reputation named Anna Eva Fay. After this, he turned away from psychic research for a time and returned to his scientific pursuits. Although he supported the foundation of the Society for Psychical Research in 1882 and even served as its president in 1886, he did not take an active part in the group's investigations. In 1875, Crookes earned the Royal Medal, awarded each year for the most important contributions for the advancement of natural knowledge. One year later, he invented the radiometer, a device which demonstrated the effects of radiation on objects in a vacuum and a device called the Crookes tube that went along with it. This invention would lead to the discovery of cathode rays, X-rays, and the electron. Crookes went on to serve on scientific committees, earning prestigious awards for his discoveries and inventing an instrument that would be used to study subatomic particles, and yet he never wavered in his belief in spiritualism. In 1916, after the death of his wife, Crookes attempted to communicate with her and was unsuccessful, but after a visit to a spirit photographer, he was able to obtain what he believed to be photographic proof that her presence was still with him. Sadly, this plate, under modern study, appears to have been double-exposed, an obvious fake. Crookes died in April 1919, never questioning that fact that the spirit world was genuine and that there were things his beloved science would never truly be able to explain. In addition to his work with D.D. Home, there was one medium with whom Crookes was most closely linked, the controversial Florence Cook. It would be his work with this young woman barely out of her teens that would not only overshadow much of the important work that Crookes did in the world of psychical research, but would lead to an alleged sex scandal that would forever taint his reputation. During the heyday of spiritualism, Florence Cook became one of the movement's most famous mediums. She was noted for her ability to produce full-form spirit materializations and became known as the first medium to do so in a fully lit room. Cook's manifestation was that of her spirit guide, Katie King. Katie already had a long history before being forever attached to the persona of Florence Cook. She first appeared during the initial spiritualism craze of the 1850s and graced the seances of many famous mediums. Like her spectral father, John King, Katie was not her real name. In life, she was said to have been Annie Owen Morgan, daughter of the pirate Henry Morgan, who was known for his raids on the Spanish-Caribbean colonies in the late 17th century. England was so pleased by Morgan's exploits against its old enemy that he was knighted by Charles II and appointed deputy governor of Jamaica. For reasons unexplained, he preferred to be known as John King in the afterlife, and his daughter adopted his name. In life, Annie Morgan had been a self-professed liar and cheat, as well as a thief and an adulteress, all this before she died in her twenties. Her new mission in death was to prove to the world the truth of spiritualism, and of course to prove the talents of a few mediums in particular. One of these was Florence Cook. Florence, or Flory as her mother called her, was born in 1856 in London's crowded, impoverished East End. As a child, she claimed she could hear the voices of angels. Her mother would later state that the girl had always been aware of the presence of spirits, but her psychic gifts only began to manifest at age 15, when she levitated a piece of furniture during a table-tilting session with friends. When she was still an adolescent, she began conducting seances in her home, 
where she became known for being able to manifest spirit faces. To create a cabinet of the kind mediums used, Florence would sit inside a large cupboard in her family's dining room. The hole had been cut high up on the door, and it was here where the faces would appear. Florence would climb into the cabinet and would allow herself to be bound to a chair with ropes around her neck, waist, and wrists. The door would be closed, and the sitters would sing a hymn to create the proper mood. The cabinet door would be opened again to show that Cook was still tied to the chair, and then it would be closed. A few moments later, the faces would appear in the opening. When they finally vanished, the cabinet door would again be opened, and Florence would be revealed, still tied to her chair, and apparently exhausted from allowing the spirits to use her energy in order to materialize. A few people noticed that the faces, which were draped with a thin white cloth, looked an awful lot like Florence. They suggested that the girl simply slipped her ropes, stood on the chair to stick her face through the hole, then tied herself back up again. Nevertheless, the audience loved her performances, and she soon gained a following. Many were impressed by the fact that she never charged a fee for her seances, and others came merely because she was an exceptionally attractive young lady. With that in mind, it's no surprise that the pretty young girl quickly became famous. In addition to her looks, her seances had other appeals as well, including the fact that the spirits had a habit of playfully tossing her into the air and, on at least one occasion, ripping her clothing off. While Florence basked in the newfound attention, some of her friends and her employer were becoming unsettled by her new gifts. Eliza Cliff, in whose school Florence worked as an assistant teacher, was reluctantly forced to discontinue her employment. The girls in the school were unsettled by the strange happenings that seemed to occur around Miss Cook, and their parents were afraid that the young ladies might become affected themselves. Miss Cliff said she was quite fond of Flory, but was compelled to part with her. By 1872, full-form materializations had become very popular at seances, and one night in that same year, a white face appeared in the darkness outside the curtains of Flory's cabinet. The floating mask was announced to be the face of Katie King, who was already a spirit to be reckoned with in America. But Katie was not the mysterious and ethereal figure of spiritualist writings. She was a proof of the resurrection of the dead, a spirit made flesh, and a young woman who could walk among and talk with the sitters. Her new body was almost indistinguishable from that of a living girl. She was a beautiful young lady, one who very closely resembled Florence Cook. As with most spiritualist mediums of the day, Florence preferred to enter her trances within the confines of the spirit cabinet, out of sight of the sitters. As long as thirty minutes might pass before the curtain would part and a figure dressed all in white and looking quite pale would emerge as Flory continued to lie unconscious in the cabinet. Occasionally, while Katie was present, Flory could be heard sobbing and moaning inside the cabinet, as if the manifestation were draining her energy. During Katie's first appearances, the spirit would simply smile and nod at the audience, but later she began to walk amongst them, offering her strangely solid hand and talking to them. She was fond of touching the sitters and allowing them to carefully touch her as well. After Katie returned to the cabinet, Florence would be found still tied up and seemingly exhausted. It was believed that spirit forms like Katie were made up of that mysterious substance known as ectoplasm. It was generally regarded during the heyday of the movement that interfering with ectoplasm or with the body of the entranced medium could be dangerous to the medium's health. If this is true, then on one occasion Florence Cook had a very close call. While it was highly improper for sitters to grab at the spirits or to touch the medium during a seance, it did sometimes happen. On the night of December 9, 1873, one of the sitters at a Cook seance was a man named William Volkman. He apparently became quite agitated by the obvious similarities between the medium and the ghost. In a fit of anger, he jumped up and grabbed Katie by the wrist, announcing loudly that she was Florence in disguise. 
For a spirit, Katie put up quite a fight and managed to succeed in leaving several bloody scratches on the man's nose. Katie was finally rescued by Edward L. G. Corner, Florence's fiancé, by the Earl and Countess of Caithness, and by Barrister Henry Dunphy, who were friends of the Cook family and aware of the inherent danger in interfering with an apparition. They seized Volkman, and a scuffle ensued, allowing Katie to make her escape. According to Dunphy, she disappeared, dissolving from the feet upward. Volkman was determined to follow up on his assault, though, and he rushed to the cabinet. There he found no sign of Katie, but he did find Flory, with her clothing in disarray, but still tied up. Was this a case of skeptical investigator gone berserk, or something else? It is significant that shortly after this incident, Volkman married another famous London medium named Agnes Nicole Guppy, a portly widow who was very jealous of the lovely Florence and her fame. The incident with Volkman did not immediately harm Flory's career as a medium, but it did shake the faith of some. She suffered a slight reversal of fortune for a time, and began looking for a new angle to pursue to garner some much-needed favorable publicity. At about the same time, medium Dee Dee Holm was undergoing testing by Sir William Crooks. Flory quickly got in touch with Crooks and offered to add her own contribution to psychical research. Crooks was delighted to investigate the now-famous partnership of Flory and Katie King and happily agreed to a series of private seances. Shortly after, what many consider to be the most problematic investigations of the spiritualist era began. Once the investigations started, Crooks invited Florence and occasionally her mother and sister to stay with him at his home on Morningtown Road in northwest London. Crooks knew that most spiritualists had a distrust of scientists, and he hoped to rectify this by inviting the young woman into his home and befriending her. Mrs. Crooks was in the house but was not much in evidence, as she was expecting their tenth child at the time and was usually confined to her room. The first time that Crooks had experienced Katie had been when Flory had initially approached him about the investigations. He had visited the Cook home and took part in a seance. He was well aware of the fact that many skeptics believed that Florence and her spirit guide Katie were one in the same person, but Crooks took note that while watching the materialized Katie, he distinctly heard a sobbing, moaning sound from behind the curtain where the young woman was supposed to be sitting. In spite of this, critics were not impressed. In March 1874, though, Crooks obtained what he felt was absolute proof that Flory and Katie were two separate entities. During a seance, Katie had walked among the sitters for a time and then retreated behind the curtain where Florence had been bound to a chair. In a minute, she reappeared and asked Crooks to accompany her behind the curtain. According to his account, he found the unconscious form of Florence Cook still bound with sealed tape. Katie had vanished, leaving Florence behind. He wrote, I found Miss Cook had partially slipped off the sofa and her head was hanging in a very awkward position. I lifted her onto the sofa and in doing so had satisfactory evidence, in spite of the darkness, that Miss Cook was not attired in Katie's costume but had on her ordinary black velvet dress and was in deep trance. According to Crook's account, he checked three different times to be sure that the woman on the floor, illuminated by a dim gas light, was actually Florence, and he was convinced that she and Katie were separate individuals. However, Crooks had still not seen them together. This opportunity came on March 29th, he said, when Katie invited him into the cabinet after he had turned out the gas light in the room. He carried with him a phosphorus light which cast only a very dim glow. However, Crooks claimed to be able to see adequately. He wrote, I went cautiously into the room, it being dark, and felt about for Miss Cook. I found her crouching on the floor. Kneeling down, I let air enter the phosphorus lamp, and by its light I saw the young lady dressed in black velvet, as she had been in the early part of the evening, and to all appearances perfectly senseless. She did not move when I took her hand and held the light quite close to her face, but continued quietly breathing. Raising the lamp, I looked around and saw Katie standing close behind Miss Cook. She was robed in flowing white drapery as we had seen her previously in the seance. 
Holding one of Miss Cook's hands in mine and still kneeling, I passed the lamp up and down so as to illuminate Katie's whole figure and satisfy myself thoroughly that I was really looking at the veritable Katie and not the phantasm of a disordered brain. Three separate times did I turn the lamp to Katie and examine her with steadfast scrutiny until I had no doubt whatever of her objective reality. At last, Miss Cook moved slightly, and Katie instantly motioned me to go away. I went to another part of the cabinet and then ceased to see Katie, but did not leave the room till Miss Cook woke up and two of the visitors came in with a light. Was this proof that Katie really was a ghost? Perhaps, but not all of the sitters at her seances were convinced. Many of them insisted on extreme measures to prevent Florence from practicing trickery. Customarily, before the seance would begin, Flory would be bound with a cord or sealed with tape. Each time the bindings were found to still be intact at the end of the evening, and although the indignities that were later inflicted on mediums, such as filling their mouths with fruit juice to prevent ventriloquism and checking all of their orifices for secreted ectoplasm, were never pressed on Flory, her hair was nailed to the floor on at least one occasion. Believe it or not, Katie still appeared. In 1874, Crooks began testing Florence, and he produced a number of photographs of Katie King and was allowed to test her appearances with Florence in plain sight. During the test, Florence reclined on a sofa behind a curtain and wrapped a shawl about her face. Soon, Katie appeared in front of the curtain. Crooks checked to be sure that Cook was still lying on the sofa, and he saw that she was, although incredibly he never moved the shawl to be sure it was really her. Crooks created 55 photographs of Florence and Katie, but only a handful of them remain today. The rest were destroyed, along with the negatives, shortly before his death in 1919. Crooks used five cameras, two of them stereoscopic, operating simultaneously during the sessions. Many of the photos were both poorly shot and questionable in authenticity, and while many of them purported to show both Katie and Florence at the same time, they mainly played right into the hands of the debunkers. Crooks was called into question about his testing methods, but he rushed to the defense of his subject. He stated that Florence agreed to every test without question and that he had never seen the slightest inclination on her part to try and deceive him. Crooks wrote, Indeed, I do not believe that she could carry on a deception if she were to try, and if she did, she would be certainly found out very quickly, for such a line of action is altogether foreign to her nature. Crooks may have been convinced of the genuineness of the Cook-King collaboration, but his critics were not. Katie looked so much like Flory simply because that's who she was, the skeptics said. It was not good enough to cite Crooks' integrity and his stature as a scientist to convince people of the authenticity of the seances. They also said that it was possible that Crooks might have had a sexual relationship with Flory, which would explain his willingness to help her perpetrate fraud. And while no evidence of this exists, it would be naive of us not to consider the possibility. There are five possible explanations for the seemingly unexplainable events that occurred between Crooks, Florence, and Katie. One, that the scientist became embroiled in an affair with Florence under his wife's nose and that he colluded with her to manufacture fraudulent results for the Katie King investigation. The rumor of a possible sexual affair followed Crooks to the grave. Not only was the suggestion made during his lifetime, but many years later it resurfaced as a possible explanation for his seemingly naive acceptance of Florence's fraud. Two, that Crooks was enamored with the girl or her alter ego of Katie and that he kept up the pretense that he believed her act to save face and to keep her close to him. It has also been suggested that perhaps Crook fell in love with the girl, but the affair was one-sided. The brilliant scientist is believed by some to have immediately seen through Florence's fraud, but because he was infatuated with her, he chose to ignore it. 3 that Florence employed a double to pretend to be Katie King. This is not as outrageous as it might sound. During the investigations, a young medium named Mary Showers stayed in the Crooks' residence while Florence was there. 
She performed a double act with Flory as the two of them would go into trances together and would create two materializations, one of Katie and one of Florence Maple, who bore more than a passing resemblance to Mary. Would it not have been possible for Mary, or even for Florence's sister, to have simply stepped in and pretended to be an unconscious Flory, slumped over and usually covered, while Flory walked about as Katie King? 4. That Florence truly believed that she was manifesting a spirit, while she had actually created a split personality, which she called Katie King. To most modern readers, the accounts of Katie's manifestations contain many clues about the nature of Florence and her possible alter ego. Katie flirted and teased, wandering about the darkened room and sitting on laps, touching and being touched, and on one occasion even stepping out of her robes to reveal her naked form. Now you can see that I am a woman, she said. Could Katie have been a way for a repressed young lady of the Victorian era to act out her innermost desires? And if so, was she doing it consciously? Or had she actually convinced herself that the manifestation of Katie was real? 5. Our final explanation. That Florence was a genuine medium. Katie was real, and Crook's investigations were completely genuine. Although Crooks behaved strangely for a man with a scientist's regard for detail, such as omitting names and addresses of witnesses from his record, this may have been in response to Flory's strict rules of secrecy. In addition, we can look to the eyewitness accounts of the seances that survive. According to Mrs. Ross Church, who was better known as the novelist Florence Marriott, daughter of the same Captain Marriott who famously fired a gun at the Brown Lady of Raynham Hall, Katie resembled Flory in some ways, but was remarkably different in others. She stated that Katie was taller and heavier than Florence, and that Katie had red hair while Flory's hair was almost black. Crooks had also noted a number of differences between the two young women. Katie was taller, heavier, and broader in the face, had a fairer complexion and longer fingers. Flory had pierced ears, Katie did not. On one occasion, Florence had a large blister on her neck, but when Katie appeared, her neck was as smooth as usual. Another time, Katie's lungs seemed to be clear while Florence was under treatment for a severe cough. Unbelievably, though, as when he failed to check under the shawl, Crooks took no comparison photographs to show the pierced and unpierced ears or the length of the girl's fingers, or if he did, he left no record of them. This seems amazing in that Crooks was investigating a phenomenon that could theoretically change the way the world believed about the afterlife. But not everyone was so careless. Cromwell Varley, the famous electrician who worked on the Atlantic Cable, believed that he had proof that Katie and Florence were not the same person. Varley, an ardent spiritualist, designed a test to prove that Florence was still in the cabinet while Katie walked about the seance room. Florence was placed in an electrical circuit with wires connected to coins that were placed on her arms so that a small current was running through her body. A large galvanometer, an instrument that detects and measures small electrical currents, was positioned ten feet away from the cabinet. It was placed on a mantelpiece in full view of the sitters so that the flow of electricity could be monitored. If Florence broke the circuit in order to leave the cabinet dressed as Katie, the galvanometer would register wild fluctuations. Katie appeared as usual, and there was no change in the current. Crooks asked Katie to plunge her hands into a chemical solution that would cause a change in the current flow if Florence had managed to dress as Katie and still get out of the cabinet. Again, the galvanometer showed no fluctuation in the current. Did this prove that Katie and Florence were not the same person? Perhaps, but it still didn't prove that Katie King was a spirit. It's still very possible that she could have been Flory's sister, or her friend Mary Showers. In 1875, Katie sadly announced that she would soon be leaving Florence and that her time visiting Earth would soon be at an end. Crooks later wrote of a scene that he witnessed when Florence and Katie said their final goodbyes. According to his account, Katie made one last appearance in the seance room and then walked over to where Flory was lying on the floor. She touched the medium on the shoulder and implored her to wake up, explaining 
that she had to leave. They talked for a few moments until Miss Cook's tears prevented her from speaking. Crooks was asked to come over and hold Florence in his arms as she was falling to the floor and sobbing hysterically. When he looked around, the white-robed figure of Katie was gone. With Katie now gone, there was no point in Flory staying on at the Crooks' home for further investigations. In fact, she told Crooks for the first time she had been married about two months before to Edward Corner. Florence went into a sort of retirement for six years but then returned to the spiritualist scene manifesting a new spirit, this one named Marie. This new spirit partner managed to provide even more entertainment than Katie had, singing and dancing for the sitters at her seances and providing contact with the spirit world. But there was something about Marie that was beginning to bother people. At a seance in 1880, Sir George Sitwell noticed that Marie's spirit robes covered corset stays, so he reached out and grabbed hold of her. He held on tightly to her, and when he pulled aside Flory's curtain, he found that the medium's chair was empty. He was not surprised to discover that he was holding on to Florence, clad only in her underwear. After that, Florence would only perform if someone were tied up in the cabinet with her. On at least one occasion, Florence Marriott participated, and she later testified that during Marie's appearance, she was firmly tied to Florence in the cabinet. This wasn't enough to keep her audiences, though, and Florence vanished into relative obscurity as a housewife in Monmouthshire. She gave her last seance in 1899 and passed away at age 48 in 1904. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Every Halloween, it's no surprise to see a few themes trending on Twitter. Among them, Happy Halloween, hashtag Bad Haunted House Themes, and hashtag My Ouija Board Said. The hashtags offer up some benign quips throughout the day, though the latter hashtag, which did employ some jokes about the popular Ouija game that is infamously known for terrifying Americans, certainly deserves a bit more attention. Ask yourself, how much do you know about the history behind the Ouija board? As it turns out, despite gaining popularity over the past 100 years, the game was apparently shrouded in mystery, with details only reportedly coming to light in recent years due to the work of a historian named Robert Merck. So let's start with the name Ouija. Merck, who specializes in tracing the origins of the board, told The Guardian that the name of the talking board came from a medium named Helen Peters. She was reportedly using the board at a house in Baltimore, Maryland one day in 1890 when she asked the board what she should call it. That is when Peters reportedly received a response. Ouija, a word that apparently means good luck. And from there, the name stuck. As it turns out, Elijah Bond, Peter's brother-in-law, was among the original investors who came together to try to turn the idea into a product back in 1890. And on February 10, 1891, the Ouija board, which looked almost exactly like what toy stores sell today, was given a patent and soon went on sale for $1.49. It was businessman and inventor William Fault who soon aggressively marketed the board. He was reportedly put at the helm of the Kennard Novelty Company, the board's first manufacturer, which figured out how to successfully sell it to the masses. Of course, at this point, you might be wondering what was it about the board 
that led it to become so popular in the first place. Before we continue, let's go back a bit further to the late 1840s when spiritualism, the idea that the living and dead could communicate, gained popularity. It was this very development that paved the way for the popularity of the Ouija board. And it's also that detail about its intended use, as well as the ongoing use of the board even today, that leads most Christians to avoid engaging in it, as we'll discuss later on. Spiritualism was truly popularized, some say, by the famous Fox sisters, who claimed they could connect with the dead. They said the deceased would tap on the walls to communicate, and soon became well known for their apparent spiritual antics. Others across the nation then tried to replicate their model, as people, especially during the Civil War, became consumed with the idea of speaking to deceased loved ones. With people seeking easier methods and tools to make that communication happen, the pieces of the Ouija board started to come together, and by 1886 the Associated Press was reporting on the existence of a wooden board with letters, numbers, and a device that would point to each tidbit to spell out messages. Without getting into too many of the details, and in case you don't know much about the board, the idea is that two or more people touch a planchette, a device that sits on the board, with that device purportedly then moving to letters of the alphabet to spell out messages. Some believe those messages come from the spirit realm and not from people moving the planchette. Or, as the patent from 1891 reads, the operation is as follows. The table is placed upon the board, and the hand of the operator is lightly laid or held on the table, when in a few moments the table will move and point to certain letters on the board, spelling and forming sentences, answering questions put by the operator or any other person that may be present at the time. Now, there's apparently three pieces of historical information worth noting. Two are quite creepy, and the other is, well, ironic. Let's start with the creepy details. First and foremost, legend has it that the board was taken to the U.S. Patent Office and that it was demonstrated to work, something apparently required in order for the patent to be issued. There's not much known about that event, but the fact that it was accepted as a product seems to indicate that there was at least a perception of authenticity. Second, Fold apparently died in a freakish manner back in 1927. His demise began while he was standing atop a Ouija board factory in Baltimore as he oversaw the replacement of a flagpole. It was on the roof that the iron support he was holding gave way, and he fell. Fold, though, reportedly grabbed onto an open windowsill to try and save himself, but the window suddenly closed and he fell to the pavement below but that's actually not what killed him. While he broke some ribs, it was a bump he hit on the way to the hospital that sent one of his bones through his heart. Oh, and equally creepy? He claimed at the time that the board had told him to build that very building he fell from. Now for the ironic twist. Peters, who apparently named the board, eventually came to hate it, telling everyone not to play with it, as she said it was prone to telling lies. Her stance was apparently shaped by a family rift after the board purportedly told her a member of the family stole some Civil War heirlooms. It was a claim that forever divided her relatives. Anyway, the board's origins as a tool to speak to spirits quickly morphed into a game that groups and families would play, and in 1966, Parker Brothers, purchased the board. The company was later bought out by Hasbro, a toy company that still sells the board to this day, appealing to the masses by marketing it as a tool with the power to connect them to the spirit world. But while many say the Ouija board is good old fun, others warn against using it, saying it's akin to inviting in evil. Christian website gotquestions.org warns Bible believers to avoid playing the game at all costs, saying it is occultism and is definitely not an option for a Christian, as it is clearly forbidden in the Bible. 
No matter how innocent Ouija boards may seem, playing with Ouija boards can be an opening for demons to invade our hearts and minds, the website proclaims. GotQuestions.org cites verses in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Galatians as precluding believers from engaging. Leviticus 19.31 reads, Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Plus, there's no shortage of terrifying Ouija board stories. Most dismiss claims like these as simple hoaxes, claiming that rather than spiritual encounters, people are instead experiencing something called the ideomotor effect. Vox described this as unconscious, involuntary physical movement and offered up a scientific theory. But there are a multitude of stories from individuals who have played with the game and who claim that, as a result, they have experienced demonic forces that have profoundly impeded and impacted their lives. I've personally spoken with countless individuals, some reluctant to admit so publicly, who felt they needed to seek faith leaders' help after using the Ouija board. Again, not everyone will believe it, but either way, many faith leaders have made one thing clear – Christians should avoid the tool, whether or not they believe it's real, as it does appear to be a form of engaging in occultism, regardless of how fun or lighthearted it might seem. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.